the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for them both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterward, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their resources. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, Trinity of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The woman who enters the gospel story today isn't given a name. Not by Luke as the narrator, nor by any of the other characters talking about her. She's a nobody. And yet, they know who she is. Or at least they know her sin. What that sin is, is not spelled out. Many have assumed over the years that she's a prostitute, but the story doesn't tell us that. Whatever her sin was, it was publicly known, a social sin that made her despised. But it seems she had met Jesus somewhere. Again, that's not particularly spelled out, but it's implied. She, weighed down by guilt and shame and public scorn, had come to Jesus like so many others like her, and had met his graciousness, God's grace in the flesh. Here was a man, a rabbi, who saw her and not just her sin. And he spoke to her words of forgiveness, God's own forgiveness. It was more than she had ever hoped to hear. And the knowledge that she was yet herself with a name, whatever it was, not just that woman, that she could stand before God. It broke her heart open with wonder, gratitude, and hope. So when she found out Jesus was going to be eating at the home of the, of, Phar of the Pharisee, Simon, she showed up there too. Somehow she made it into the house, and not only into the house, but right behind Jesus as he reclined to eat with his feet behind him. And she did things no woman would do, much less a sinner like herself. She washed his feet with her tears and dried them with unbound hair. 
kissed them and anointed them with oil. Imagine the courage that it took to do that, to face public ridicule and censure, to make herself a target. And yet her need to show gratitude and love and worship compelled her beyond fear. But Simon, the host of the dinner party, didn't see any of that. He just saw what he'd always seen, a sinner. And in his mind, this woman's actions proved not only her own unworthiness, but Jesus's too. Because if Jesus was really a prophet, he'd know who this woman was, and he would never let her touch him. Jesus asked Simon, do you see this woman? No, Simon doesn't. But Jesus does. And he sees Simon, too, sees what's in his heart and thoughts. Jesus doesn't see what others probably did, a respected religious leader graciously hosting the traveling rabbi for dinner, and a sinful woman daring to push in where she didn't belong. Jesus sees instead the open-handed love of one and the closed-fisted scorn of the other. For Simon wasn't a sinner. Not that he would say he never sinned. He was too well-versed in the law for that, and probably went through the prescribed ritual cleansings for sin. But he didn't see any big sin in his life. He wasn't defined by his sin. He didn't feel that he had received the unmerited grace of God's forgiveness without which he wouldn't dare stand. And so from his heart, unbroken as it was by sin or forgiveness, there was no flowing river of compelling, transformative love. He was sure that he was the one seeing clearly, but instead he was blind. Jesus saw the truth about them both. He tells a story to illustrate for Simon that those who are forgiven much love much, and those who are forgiven little love little. And he's right, of course. Those who pour themselves out in love for God and their neighbor are often those who know the depth of forgiveness they have received as a free gift from God. When we think that we are doing pretty well on our own, we might still do good acts. Society is built to some degree on nice, respectable people doing good things. But in general, we live with our hands closed much tighter. And we're more likely to see the good that we do as one more proof of our own worth and goodness. And that feels safer. Because confession is a risky business. Real confession means facing the worst of ourselves. The things that we put before God in our lives. The ways that we are comfortable with systems that oppress people we don't see. The jealousy and anger and pettiness that consume us, the people we have hurt with our words and actions, the good that we have lacked the courage to do, all those things that we have done and left undone, and that bent toward sin against God and neighbor that we just can't escape. To truly confess our sins is to look into a mirror that we would rather avert our eyes from. Our society in general tends to avoid confession, to avoid the idea of sin altogether. Donald Trump, for one, has flatly stated that he doesn't confess to God. Why do I have to repent or ask for forgiveness if I am not making mistakes, he has said. And if he does make a mistake, he says he doesn't bring God into that picture, he just tries to make it right himself. Admittedly, few might be quite as blatant about it, especially those who profess to be Christians. But in truth, he's not alone. Even for those of us who are in church regularly, it's quite possible to say the words of the confession and remain at the surface level, to avoid facing the deep knowledge of our own sinfulness. We can say those words, hear the absolution, and still feel like we're mostly doing okay on our own. But one who is forgiven little loves little. Jonathan Swift is quoted as having said in 1711, we have just enough religion to hate, but not enough to make us love one another. Pastor Brian Stoffergen puts a different spin on that quote. 
Perhaps we want just enough forgiveness so that we don't feel so bad, but not enough to make us change our lives. Being forgiven does feel good. And when we see it as the equivalent of wiping a little dirt off our face without touching the core identity of who we are, we feel tidied up and ready to go on with being the good people that we essentially are, which leaves us plenty of room to judge others who need more than their faces cleaned up. And that does not fill our hearts with the kind of love and gratitude that changes everything, the way we see, the way we act. So we can't afford to stay in the shallows and to avoid looking truly into the mirror that confession holds up to us. We can't afford it for our own sake. When we refuse to see the depth of our sin, we also can't experience the full depth of God's love and of relationship with God. How can we really hear the good news of the new identity God gives us if we never admit the truth about our old one? How can we rest in the enormity of God's gift in Christ if we are so busy working to maintain the facade of being good enough on our own? And how can we know the joy of being fully seen and known and loved anyway if we never open that up to God? Confession can be painful, but it can also be the gateway to freedom and new life. And it is not only for our own sakes that it matters, but for the sake of the world. In its true essence, the church is not a gathering of respectable, moral, like-minded people. It is a community of forgiven and forgiving sinners. People who know what they have received and who in turn share that same love with others. And there is so much need for people like that in the world, for a church like that in the world. The woman in today's story, she'd been forgiven by Jesus himself. She was made right with God. But that didn't change the way people saw her. It changed her sense of herself, but her community didn't feel itself bound by Jesus' words. And that probably continued to be the case even after this dinner, where Jesus once again publicly repeated her forgiveness. What she and those of us like her need is a church truly being the church. People who, from the position of their own brokenness, see her as a person and enact the reality that Jesus makes possible. Church being church doesn't care what others think because the people in such a church live from the place of knowing the depth of their own sin and Jesus' gracious ability to forgive and make new. And so they cross boundaries and welcome the outcast and the stranger. The love they have received from Jesus needs an outlet, and it has the power to heal, to comfort, to lift up, to break down barriers, to transform. 2,000 years after the ascension, we can't anoint Jesus' feet as the woman did. But we can be out in our communities doing that for our neighbors. We can clothe them, feed them, shelter them, advocate for them, welcome them listen to them. And Jesus tells us, and centuries of Christian witness attest, that in doing so, we actually can touch and serve and love Jesus himself. People whose core identity is not that of being a forgiven sinner can still do very good things in the world. We see that every day. But it's those who know themselves to have received great undeserved love in God's forgiveness who seem most often to be compelled to pour themselves out for God and neighbor in thanksgiving and love. When our hearts are broken open, we truly see. We see the depth of God's love and grace and the humanity and the dignity and the needs of our neighbors. And the more we see, the more our hearts break to realize how far this world and we ourselves are from living according to God's intention. But with that true vision, we also see God at work in the world, in beauty and in brokenness. And we see that God is calling us to be a part of it. You probably took note of the fact that we didn't do the order for confession and forgiveness at the beginning of the service today, like we usually do. 
We felt that for today, it was perhaps more meaningful to move it to after the sermon, so that having heard the word in the reading from Luke, we can answer God's invitation to truly know both the depth of our own brokenness and the power of God's forgiving love. And so now I invite you to stand as we confess our sins before God and hear the word of forgiveness. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. You may kneel. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 